Sat Gure Name, Siri Gurude Name, Ad Gure Name, Jugad Gure Name, Sat Gure Name, Siri Gurude Name, Ad Gure Name, Jugad Gure Name, Sat Gure Name, Siri Guru Deve Name. Sat Nam. So we had a correction yesterday of the, what did I say? It was 82 billion? Let's calculate it again, because that's three wrongs don't make a right. <laughs> we were talking about the, uh, the amount of blood cells. So let's, that, you're, that you produced in that 62-minute uh, meditation yesterday. I caught wind of some very important questions couple of very important questions. Pretty close to the first class that I ever had with Yogi Bhajan, <clears throat> he said, which is totally intuitive, it's, but it runs against everything that we hear in public. Life is an experience, an understanding the experience. If you just have the experience and don't understand the experience, you have no relationship with the experience. If you have a lot of understanding but no experience, you have no relationship with life. The soul body, the thing that actually infests is not you. You're not the soul. The physical body, the thing that houses you, is not you. You're not your physical body. You're the experience of that union between the soul body and the physical body. That's what we are. And we experience or not, via what's called consciousness. An interchangeable word for consciousness historically was spirit. And that was the fundamental difference between spirit and soul. Soul is like electricity. Physical body is like iPod. Experience is like the music. What does the electricity in the iPod enable? It enables an experience. Now, as human beings, we can go through life experiencing the experience, or we can go through life avoiding the experience. And pretty much every class that's been taught, whether it was morning sadhana, or whether it was Sevak Singh, or whether it was Gurudev Singh, or whether it was my class, we're all talking about the same thing. Boy, Barbie has a distinct voice. They call the pink camp phone Barbie. Such a retro ring, isn't it? Reminds you of your childhood. I say that with experience. I look around and I say, probably doesn't remind all of you of your childhood because you were probably born in the digital age. And what I wanted to do for you this week was give you an experience with understanding. So I don't want to bring in you know, all of what 
you know, volumes upon volumes. So you go away and go, wow, Guru Singh really knows a lot. Because that's not what's important. What I want you to go away from this week with is I want you to go away with the sensation of, wow, I really have a lot going on that is of value. As a, as a man, as a yogi, as a conscious being, I have a lot going on, and I am going to work at getting all of I have going on going. Now, another question was, why did all the mystics live in the distant past? I value that question very highly. So that's a story. I agree with the first part, but I don't agree with the word harder. Now let's just... I want you to raise your right hand. And repeat after me. I am a mystic. There we go. So where are all the mystics today? Right here. Right here. Okay. Kur. What does Kur mean? Kur. Heart. Frenchman. What does Aj mean? Time. What is the word? Courage. Courage. Hmm? It means a time of the heart. Now, if you want to live in a time of your heart, you are going to have courage. And it's going to take a great deal of courage to be a mystic. Because usually when you are a mystic, other people think you're a misfit. They just get the pronunciation a little bit wrong. I was the definition, the initial definition of the word crazy is doesn't appear to be normal. Now, based on that definition, I'd say we've got a room full of crazies because you don't appear to be normal. Do you? Some of you might, from time to time, make an attempt. And it's usually a failure. And the time that we, as mystics, are most miserable is when we are trying to fit in, trying to be normal. What we really have to do is we have to gather community. We have to gather those around us that will allow us to be who we are. And that takes courage because it takes a little bit of enforcement. You have to enforce who you are. First, to yourself. And then it will appear to everyone else. But in order for you to do that, you have to be able to have your standards more essential than the standards that are being applied to you. And I love the response about if we had a royal, you know, prince, princess, queen, whatever, in the room, you know, the, the, you are asking me to be less than you, so I'm actually going to be more than you, and to heck with you, and all that you stand for, and all that you believe in. And that's this teeter-totter that goes on in most of our lives, where we're less than, more than, less than, more than, less than, more than. 
And that's called chaos, and it produces a lot of background noise inside of our brain. What we're striving for is without all of that interpersonal event, what we're striving for is to produce the sensation of equality at all times. Even equal to God. No one who has ever lived on this earth, no one who has ever lived on this earth is greater than you. No one. No matter what the story is about how their life unfolded, no one is greater than you. Not the prophets, not the avatars, not the gurus. They may have been able to motivate, to motivate their intention, but they're not greater than you. You may be able to drive your truck, but you're not greater than ocean. And ocean isn't greater than you. Ocean being the sun. The equality allows us to reach up through the noise or the maya or the illusion, whatever it is. The equality allows us to reach up through all of this, which we have to deal with in life, and we have to deal with it successfully. Allows us to reach up through it and connect to source. And I'm not saying that source is up there. That's just a metaphor. We have to be able to work with maya. Maya is an illusion, right? Maya means illusion, correct? And even science knows that this is not solid matter. The fact that my hand can't pass through my hand is an ancient agreement. And because I haven't been able to hack the code that writes the agreement, I'm limited to the fact that my hand can't pass through my hand. I'm limited to the fact that I cannot pass through the ground. I'm limited to the fact that I cannot float in the air. Because these are all elemental agreements. That this is how the illusion is going to be constructed. But if we could hack the code, we could deconstruct the illusion. But that's how you get tapas, cities, you know, how you get the powers. But that's not what we're after. We're not after having power over the elements. We're after utilizing the actual elements and creating something benevolent, a benefit to everyone. That's human purpose. And even though we have this word called God, Yogi Bhajan said it best, God is an acronym. You know what an acronym is? It's when you have letters that make up a, a squishy word like MCI, TRW, USA, uh, FBI, huh? KMC, NHL, yeah! KFC. An acronym for generates, organizes, delivers, destroys. G O D. Because God is not something there, God is something that creates out of nothing. The Shabbat this morning. I'd love to have that Shabbat tonight with the same description because infinity is nothing. God being infinity has to be what? Nothing. 
God is nothing. The miracle is that from nothing comes something. Infinity, let's just get it straight, right? Our brain is going, uh, uh, he's trying to stretch, you know? Infinity, it can't be anything. Because if it was something, it would be dividing something. And the only way our brains can actually think of infinity is that it's a big space, big, very, very big space. And then we get to the end of it, and then we have to so go get, take a breath and then go into the next space, right? It's like a series of spaces. That's how our brain can conceive of infinity. But infinity is just nothing forever, always. And Guru Nanak said, don't even try to think of it. Don't even try to conceive of it. Just go, hmm. <laughs> do it. Do it. Hmm. Hmm. Do it. Do it. Hmm. And that is where the word nam comes from. Because hmm. Hmm. It's hmm. Mm. Mm. And what does that mean? That means that within nothing, I am. Mm. Within nothing, I am. Now you think of it. If you got nothing, and this is a continuation of this morning's class, right? If you've got nothing... If there's no possibility of doing anything, you're at your best. And that's why the sannyasis and the swamis and the renunciates and the monks would wander into the wilderness with nothing. And then go through the villages beg begging for something. <laughs> what a scam, huh? What a scam. Oh, I am so humble, I have nothing. Could I please have something? Because you're not as humble as I am. And you've got something. And I actually need something right now because my tummy is very, very, very empty, you know. But I am so humble, I have nothing. <laughs> it is such a scam. It's like, I am lazy, so I'm not going to work. I am, you know, full of myself, so I'm going to walk around naked. But I'm going to ask you, who's working to give me something because I got to eat. Today's world is about being grist ashram. Grist ashram. The life of an enlightened metropolitan worker. <laughs> That's actually an updated translation. Um, it means the life of an enlightened householder. One who can stand. Huh. One who can be real. One who can have the courage to within all of the puzzle of Maya trick the puzzle. We heard the story of the nothing, you know, and Yogi Bhajan saying, okay, where's my gift, right? And the people are like flat busted broke and going broker and okay, where's my gift? Because what is flat busted broke? Begins with an S-T-O-R-Y. It's a story. Flat busted broke is a story of accounting. And what is the key word in count? account? I just gave it away. Accounting. Count. If you got nothing to count, what do you have to depend upon? Your other account. And your other account is faith and trust. Faith and trust. Don't ever misuse these two words. 
Don't ever say, I have faith in or I trust this. Because faith and trust have no object. Faith and trust are an account that goes with you. And the way you invest in your accounts of faith and of trust is by having moments when you can count nothing and you still prevail, you still act. All of this means that you have to have your direction. Hmm? You have to be in touch with your momentum, your ankle. You have to be in touch with your standards. And let's face it, the world around you is not going to support you in your crazy nature. So you're going to have to relieve yourself of the need for sympathy from the world around you. Because if you lock yourself into that relationship of gaining sympathy from the world around you by having something that, they, that you need from them, then their standard is going to be greater than your standard and you're going to be depleting your account of faith and your account of trust. And you know what it really is? It's just a big socially accepted excuse because it's extremely socially accepted. As a matter of fact, the human being is the only creature that uses sympathy. If you've ever watched nature films, if there's some, if there's one of the herd that needs sympathy, that guy is lunch. I remember a couple of years ago, Disney put out a, a you know, a big film called Earth. Remember that film? Released in theaters. And there was this one scene that took place up in the far north, and there was a herd of caribou. And all of a sudden, the camera focuses in on one of the little newborn baby caribou. And I said to my wife, I said, oh, shh. This does not look good. And then, you know, the little baby was marching along. And, 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 and the herd was getting a little ways ahead of the baby. And the baby, and every once in a while, you'd see the herd look back and go, shit. <laughs> and they would go a little faster. And the little baby was kind of like, wasn't quite up to the, to the speed. And then they do what they always do in those nature films. Boing! The predator. I said to my wife, I said, I'm out of here. And I went out into the lobby. And I didn't have to be watching the movie because about three minutes later, about five four-year-olds with their mothers came crying out of the theater. That's what happens to the need for sympathy until we become a human being. And a human being is required to use sympathy until, as I told you yesterday, we reach the end of puberty. When if we have made the connection where we're actually connecting with our experience, we develop the capacity for what? Empathy. Sympathy leads to empathy leads to, say it louder, compassion. That's the developmental stages, like squirming leads to crawling, leads to walking, leads to running, leads to riding a bike, leads to driving a car, right? Or a motorcycle, if you're really crazy. <laughs> Good crazy. Sympathy 
is something that is so woven into the fabric of society that you have to be really on your game to be able to discover where it is that you request it. And you have to be able to see where it is that you request sympathy. And what Yogi Bhajan said was that if you can't pay for everything in every moment for everyone, you're asking for sympathy. doesn't mean that it has to come out of your pocket. It means that you have to orchestrate it. And if any of you were with him when he would orchestrate it, he would get up from a meal and he would say, Guru Singh, pick up the check. He paid for the meal by orchestrating how the meal got paid for. Because the one thing that he hated more than anything else was everybody sitting around trying to figure out what the heck they ate. And then somebody says, well, let's just divide it 10 ways. He looked at that and he thought that was absolutely despicable. It's like that book. Do you remember that book that was around for a while called Who Moved My Cheese? Remember that? Who Moved My Cheese? And what he said was when we're all sitting like this and we got our little pile and our little stash, Basically, he would just look at anything and he would say, it's ours. We're responsible for this bill. Let's pay for it. So-and-so, pay for it. What he wanted to do was he wanted to unhook us from our need to be protecting our cheese. It, 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 it. That's why he would ask somebody who was totally in debt for some really wonderful gift. What was he asking for? What was he asking for that person to give up, the gift or their story? And what was their story? What was the story confirming? And they could go to all of their accountants and all their lawyers and get the story confirmed. What was their story confirming? In that moment, what was their story confirming? They were bust. They were broke. They had no money. It's an interesting idea to have no money. It means no value. And what he was saying was, no, if you have value, if you really value yourself, if you really value yourself and you're sitting at a table of 25 people, if you really value yourself and you're sitting at a table of 25 people who have all just had a huge meal, and you stand up and you say, Frank... Or Sarah, pay for the meal. What is your first concern? What is your first concern? What will that do to my relationship? First of all, to Frank and Sarah, but also to everybody else sitting at the table. Who the heck do you think you are? standing up and telling me to pay for the whole meal. If you're able to stand up and ask somebody to pay for the whole meal, what do you have to be willing to do? Pay for it yourself. Because it's not about how much money have you stolen and put in your pocket. And now you're walking around with it. Oh, you say your mother and father made the money and you inherited it? Oh, you say you have a really great job and you earned it? Did you really? Or is it just some scam of numbers with certain fictitious values assigned to certain jobs, right? And now you've got this cash in your pocket. That is not the current or the future value of money. That is the who moved my cheese. The true value of money is that money is a system 
that enables all humanity to exist so that we don't have to haul all of our stuff to the marketplace and trade it. We can haul the value of all of our stuff in an iPhone with a barcode reader. Correct? And we can use that one little piece of metal and plastic to make phone calls and pay our bills. Correct? But shouldn't it just be okay for us all to be okay? Shouldn't the real nature of humanity not be the Ayn Rand's version of Atlas Shrugged, of everyone for himself, and to heck with the poor? If you're poor, you deserve to be poor? Isn't the true nature of a human man one who can pay for anything at any time always? In some way or another, everybody gets covered, correct? Because when we think about it, when we truly investigate it, we will find that we are connected to everyone, even those that are suffering, even though we might have put a lot of story and a lot of noise between us and them that makes us feel that we're independent of that suffering that's going on in that far corner of the globe. We are not. We are paying for that suffering physically, emotionally, mentally, and spiritually. And the only true value of money, even though the way the bankers and the accountants and everybody has produced over the last two, three, four hundred years of the industrial age, the only true value of money is the value of life. In order for us to have that, we need to go from our, from our foundation, which is our legs. Everybody come standing up. Come standing up. Get into horse stance with your feet parallel. Get into horse stance with your feet parallel. Put your hands on your, put your hands on your thighs just, just beyond your knees. And just feel, just grip the earth with your feet, with your toes. Just experience the sensation. Get your feet parallel. No, no, no pointing out. Get them parallel. It'll feel weird because most people fan their feet out when they come into horse stance. Just get them parallel. Come down. Let some, let some pressure come into your shoulders. Let your shoulders bunch a little bit around your ear. Now get your body. So here you are, your, your body. This is a body that you've, been, you've inherited from your, your team, right? Your mom and dad and their parents. and Seven generations of DNA, and we've got this body. And everything that we experience in life, whether it's a thought, an emotion... An experience of a physical experience comes from how we manage this body, how we manage what we feed it, how we manage how we move it, and it's an accumulative management. So come standing up now. Now, it's an accumulative management. Yoga is a concentration of accumulative management of the physical body. You go into a particular posture. You put a particular force through it with prana, with, yo, with breath, with all of this attitude. And what you're doing is you're actually creating an attitude within the body so that when you come out of that posture, you can move through life more like you are balanced, more like you are a creature of the infinite. The, 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 the stupidest thing an animal ever did Stand on two legs. You don't see anything. St Look at the tables. You don't see anything standing on two legs. Why did the human being stand on two legs? Well, for two reasons. One was an immediate need of migration. And in order to migrate, we had to raise up and see where we had to go to because we'd run out of food. Just like the world is doing right now. The world is running out of water that is usable. And when we run out of water, we will run out of food. 
And there is going to have to be a new standing up. And what is the new standing up? The old standing up was to stand up like this to see. What is the new standing up? The rising of the kundalini. The standing up of the kundalini. So not only can we see through our sensory system, but we can see through our higher consciousness. And then when we stand up to see through our higher consciousness, we find those who are poor, we find those who are in need of health, we find those who are in need of food, and we begin to take care of everything so that everyone begins to take care of everyone else. And this idea, this idea of money and capital and democracy and all of these ideas that don't exist in the world today. There is no capital, there is no democracy, there is none of those things in the world today. There is just pure need. And the neediest will become the most hoarding. They collect the most and they hoard the most. I have a student, makes $28 million a year. I have another student, worth $2.5 billion. I have many, many students who make three, four, five, six million dollars a year. Many students worth hundreds of millions of dollars. The last thing I ever talk to those people about is money because they know nothing about money. It'll be decades before they can even have a conversation about it. Because Gandhi said it best. If you have more than you need, you've taken it from the backs of the pool. As men, our task, as men, our task is to see that everyone is taken care of. And it doesn't matter if we're heterosexual or homosexual. That isn't an issue. We're not talking in here about, you know, your partner, your wife, your, the woman and the man. We're all men and women. We're all male and female. The male part of us is to see that everyone is taken care of. The female part of us is to take care of everyone. The male part of us orchestrates, and the female part of us performs. The job of a father, if a, if, a, if a man and a woman have a child, the job of the father is to make sure that the mother is taken care of so the mother can give nourishment to the child. It never ends. How are you standing? Are you standing consciously for 10% of your day? Do you actually have a relationship with your feet? Ask yourself that question. Do you have a relationship with your ankles? Or do you just have a relationship with the sensation that goes through your body, the thought that goes through your head? Do you have a relationship with your toes? Do you talk to your toes? Do you have a personal relationship with your knees? If you don't have a personal relationship with your knees, they will get deteriorating a little bit over time. A little bit, after a little bit, after a little bit, and then you'll say, oh, my knee went out, and then you'll find some reason why it went out, which isn't the reason why it went out. It's just the last reason of you not paying attention to your knees. We are just the experience of the soul body and the physical body. We're just the experience. We are the next standing up. We are the ones that are here at this men's camp. You know, everybody had a story. And common to a lot of the stories was, I didn't think I was going to come, and then I realized I had to. 
Did you make a decision if that was the case? Probably not. Probably the decision was made for you because it's like, does the alarm clock make a decision when the alarm goes off? Or is it just programmed to go off when the time is right? That's exactly like us experiencing time without consciousness. The alarm goes off and we show up someplace. I have my calendar locked in for years and years and years for men's camp. There's two things that I have my calendar locked in for, summer solstice and men's camp. There's not ever going to be a time that men's camp isn't going to happen. And as long as I'm happening, I'm happening at men's camp when men's camp is happening. Because I want to be in charge of my calendar. I don't want my calendar to be in charge of me. I don't want, I don't want somebody running around at 4 o'clock in the morning with a damn drum. You know, rise up, some rise up song. You know, rise up, rise up. No. I want to be up at at least 5 to 4 so that I can just say, ha. Ah, they're doing it again. I don't want them to startle me out of a deep sleep. I want to be up so I can enjoy. The best thing is when you hear the drum in the distance, isn't it? And then you hear it creeping towards you. And then you try to figure out, who's doing it this morning? I think I recognize that voice. <laughs> People tell me at summer solstice where I do wake up that their favorite thing, now, my favorite thing is when I hear you in the distance and you just keep getting closer and closer and closer. And what is my question? Did you get up? <laughs> As men, we were, were trapped in a male body. We've not always been a man. Of course, we've been many lifetimes. It's trapped in this male body. We have a job to do. And we just got assigned to what Yogi Bhajan used to call a half-star hotel. You remember the Eagles in Hotel California? Well, the Hotel Earth, he said, is a half-star hotel. Toilets aren't flushed, aren't cleaned. Sheets are dirty, food doesn't exist. You know, this is a mess. But look at what the mess exists within. What is a mess about the hotel room? The human way the human manages it. Not manages the earth, but basically manages the human. We're the only ones that are shitting too much. I mean, I know that agribusiness and the methane from the slaughter yards are a big problem, but those cows would not be reproducing in the numbers that they're reproducing if it wasn't for the humans that wanted to eat them. The only thing that's out of balance is the human being. And what is the human being standing on two legs to discover? Begins with a B A L A N C E. You're doing good. The human being is born to walk on two legs, a horse is up in two minutes. A deer is up in less because a deer is not domesticated. A deer stands up the moment it gets to the ground. It reaches up for the nipple. The minute it touches the ground, a human baby hangs around mom and dad for like 18 years. <laughs> uh, 
That doesn't matter. It's all a joke. <laughs> the human being is not a work animal. The human being is a worship instrument inside of which the soul body ignites the physical body to have the experience which is Guru Singh or Harpal or Sevak or Hari or any of you in here. All you are is the experience of the union. And what you have to do is you have to take this capacity standing. And that's the review from yesterday. Now, let's start talking about today's class. So, from the pelvic bowl, standing on planet Earth, completely Completely. What does that look like? Huh? What sacred objects look like that? Hmm. Shinto shrine. And that's exactly what the Shinto shrine is emulating. Did you know that the pelvic bowl is the only part of your body that actually mirrors? And what mirror means that if 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 something, is, if something on this side of the mirror is going this way, then it will appear in the mirror that it's going that way, correct? And you see the pelvic bowl is a mirror image of the earth. And so the concept of your earthly existence, which rests in your pelvic bowl because this is where you are conceived, and the concept of who you are, comes from that. And that's why you actually need to, with your two legs, create this parallel so that you're equal to the earth. You're equal to the earth. Every step you take is telling the rest of your body, I'm equal to the earth, I'm equal to the earth, I'm equal to the earth. So anything that comes in your way, you see as equal. When something is equal, you can use fear, fear used by the deer to make them more aware. A deer in a forest uses fear, just the right amount of fear. Unless they run out on a road and some human is coming down with their brights on, then it's a deer in the, a deer caught in the headlights because their fear is letting the information in. That's what fear does. Fear is like salt. Fear lets the information in. That's why when something big happens in your life, what happens? What's your first instinctual emotion? Fear, for a good reason. Fear, whoo, lets it in. Now, if you don't have a relationship with fear, which Guru Dev Singh was telling us about earlier, if you don't have a relationship with fear, if fear's not your buddy, then you go, whoa, you know, like you feel really, and you'll run away from the situation. And you will say, you will do, blame it on fear. My fear made me run. No, your fear didn't make you run. Your unwillingness to merge with the situation made you avoid the situation. So you have this pelvic bowl that's holding all of these glands and organs that sit above the pelvic bowl. So you've got your stomach and your intestines and your liver and, you know, you've, and your, you know, your spleen and your pancreas. And your colon comes up like this got all this stuff sitting it's like it's like just a perfect perfect feature perfect feature how's your pelvis holding it are you about to spill it how's your pelvis holding it how often do you think about it i think about it five times a day how's my pelvic bowl and when i have an emotional reaction to something I immediately go, hmm. And I dial in to, okay, what is actually the message in here? Because if I have an emotional reaction to something that you do, or something that I think, or something that I hear on a radio or television, basically I have to go, this is not my guide, this is my gauge. How am I, how am I holding? How am I holding? all of this power because this power that is held in your pelvic bowl it's overflowing 
This power that's held in your pelvic bowl is going to give you an emotional charge that's going to motivate you. You know that right leg, that right thigh motivation? Is that motivation focused? Or is it going off in different directions? The world doesn't happen out there. The world happens in here projected through all of these filters. This is how the world happens. What's the first manifestation of something coming from nothing? Which are the same frequencies, same vibrations, right? Sound is light. Light is sound. Now, in order to form you, which is an electromagnet, electrochemical magnetic accumulation, the focal point, around which you gather matter, is this. A pretty sacred story. You are an intention of going all the way from nothing through something back to nothing. And you're at the end of the journey, and you're like the guy that's captain on the boat or a, a lower officer on the boat of life, and you're, you're to carry people because you're at the end of your journey. You actually don't need to criticize the people that are doing the weird things on the earth like polluting the earth and fracking the earth and maiming the earth and doing all these things. You don't have to criticize those people. You have to carry them. I was hearing a story of one of our grandchildren and how this grandchild is teaching its parents, you know, and it's like arms and, you know, getting it into the bathtub, right? It's like this child is a master of not taking a bath. Many of the children on earth are masters of not understanding anything not understanding the results, the consequences of their sequence. So what is it? What is your job with that child? Yes. <coughs> Be dirty. Huh? Is that your job? Day in, day out, your job is to figure out the most creative the most compassionate, the most delicious way so that the household doesn't revolve around that event. Our job at this level is to get over our own stuff so we can start taking care. What do you have to do if you're on kitchen duty and you're eating the meal? You got to finish your meal so that you can get and do kitchen duty. We have to finish our meal. We have to get over our needs now, you know. And we got to get over all of those excuses that we so conveniently use so that we can get on with the benevolence of why we were born. Because we were born, I mean, standing around going, oh, that's, that's messed up. Whoa, that's messed up. Whoa, that's really messed up. You know, standing around and being able to see all this stuff that is so messed up would be like me visiting Hari Singh and watching the event of the little child with all of the, you know, this and that and the other thing around mealtime and going, wow, that's messed up. <laughs> I could mask it. I could keep it to myself, right? I could think. And then go, 
right? What would the ultimate relationship be? Connected or disconnected? Disconnected. So my relationship within that household would be an absolute lie in comparison to what the actual cosmic condition is, correct? So every time I was in that household and I was reacting to that event, I would be in a state of non-truth. I would be in a state of duality, correct? So what happens here is that we've all got this blue bit here. And this blue bit has our future, which is not yet unfolded. It's got the part that's going through the light lens right now. And bless you. And it's got and it's got the part that we've already been through, which is the past. And oftentimes this is known as Akasha. A K A S H A. And it's the history of all of your incarnations, but it's also the future history of your incarnations. And since we're at the level that we are, this is the last one. We're not coming back. You want to learn where to pee and poop again? How to talk some language? What a waste of time. Just liberate in this lifetime. So basically what we have is the light passes through that film, and then it passes through the lens, and the lens is made up of the two forces. The two forces are the genealogy, which is your body right now, this blue is what your consciousness has been through, what your experience and registration of the experience has been through. This is made up of your physical body and soul body coming together. So those two things affect how your story gets projected through. If you're not paying any attention to soul body, I'm not talking about God here, I'm talking about the cosmic influence the cosmic influence on your physical world, if you're not paying any attention, we're talking about that diagram that, uh, that Gurdav Singh was giving us before. What did he say? There's no, and it begins with D. Begins with D E, D E P, D E P T. It's like playing a game of horse and you can slam dunk and everybody else is two feet tall, man. <laughs> depth. No depth. D E E P. <laughs> Deport. <laughs> you didn't hear that word earlier today. So that light then casts out through your film, which is going to create what's needed in your world. It produced you for me today. It produced you for me today. It produced me for you today. That's in your film. How you see me is up to the relationship you have in the lens. So it goes through there and it casts off. And here's where we all are. For you, here's where we all are. We're your screen. You're standing there. We are all your screen. So the light, I'm just going to use you. The light's coming through, and of course we always go like this because we're five sensory, three-dimensional beings, and so we pretend that light comes through from above, but it doesn't. It actually emanates from the infinity within. Within, 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 to do nothing, right? From nothing comes something. Gu, nothing. Ru, light. Guru, light that comes from nothing. So that comes from within you. It casts out to all these people. It reflects off of us, and it comes back to you. And then you do with it what you will. It reflects off a, a street sign. You do with it what you will. It reflects off a person. You do with it what you will. Tomorrow we're going to learn, well, what does that mean that the person that's a screen in our life is? Are they nothing? Tomorrow we're going to learn about what that means. But it, it reflects back to us, and then we, 
absorb that and claim that it's you. But it isn't you. It isn't you. What happens to you happens. What happens, say it louder, what happens to you happens. This is the nature of nature. So why do we spend so much time counting what's happening and making determinations as to what that means? Because we have to make sense of the puzzle in order to solve the puzzle. If you buy a thousand piece puzzle, what is the first thing you look for? The straight edges, right? Because you know that nobody makes a puzzle with straight edges on the inside, do they? And you also want to find a piece that has, somebody said it earlier, corners, two straight edges. And now you go, whoa, we frame, and then you frame in you frame in the picture. The same thing happens with your sensory system. You frame in the picture. How do little children draw, draw pictures of people? Little children, and probably us, draw pictures of people by framing it in, correct? And then they'll put in some details Right? But they draw the outline first. Is that how it's actually seen? What is the outline that you draw? What is the outline? Right, so the line around it doesn't exist, does it? The line around it actually identifies it. Because around Savik Singh is everything that we believe isn't Savik Singh. Everything around Savik Singh is what we believe is the space around him. And by the way, nothing doesn't even have empty space. Because empty space is something. Nothing, say it, nothing doesn't even have empty space. Nothing doesn't even have space. That's great. Does this make sense? Does this make sense? Does this make sense? This is what's happening in your world right here, right now. What's happening in all of our worlds right here, right now, is that we all have each other, we all have each other in our film. Not from right here, right now. Nobody is met by, oh, by chance. Oh, by chance. You and your son were tuning in to the pre-moment. It was already in the film that you would meet his mother. Where was it? At Whistler. And he was, he was interpreting the meeting of his mother by saying, I want to meet my mother. But it wasn't that I want to meet my mother. It was actually, I am going to meet my mother. And that's what desires are. The idea of being, Yogi Bhajan taught us about being desireless. Haven't you heard? on the spiritual path to be desireless? Yes? Correct? Okay, we're going we're gonna to be desireless for a moment. Inhale. Exhale. Is there a little desire coming up inside of you? What is it for? You cannot be desireless in the human form, in an existing form of life. You cannot be desireless as a tree. You cannot be desireless as a rock. You cannot be desireless as an animal. 
you cannot be desireless as a person. But when you realize that your desires are actually markers on the path that is optional in front of you, then you've got five desires. Two of them may correspond to a single path. The other three correspond to three unique other paths. How many paths do you have in front of you with those five desires? Huh? Four paths. Then you make a choice, don't you? You make a choice as to which of the desires you're going to fulfill. When you make a choice of which of those desires you're going to fulfill, you choose a path. The more that you can see the bigger picture, like Google Earth, you say, I see that that desire leads to this, even though you can't see it for five years. I see that that desire leads to that, even though you can't see it for 15 years. I see that this other desire leads to this, and that won't happen for 25 years, but I like it. So I'll make that, I'll fulfill that desire right here, right now. And then each moment, you're going to have those coming up. And where they are being dictated from is going to be here, between the diaphragm and the pelvic bowl. Because between the diaphragm and the pelvic bowl is where all of your emotional charge takes place. So what does that say about the nature of the diaphragm? Is it important? It's an incorrect association. The heart cannot have any emotion whatsoever. That's why it gets blamed. Because if the heart had an emotion, every once in a while I would say, to heck with you, I'm taking a day off. The heart has to be, and I'm not criticizing your statement, because it's, and I'm glad you brought up the question, because it's the common sensation. The heart has to be totally neutral at all times because it has to beat no matter what. If you're out with a 45 automatic in your hand robbing a bank, your heart's got to be beating. If your heart had emotion, it would say, I'm going to kill this sucker because this isn't going to turn out well. So let's just, let's just kill this body and be done with it, right? The heart is totally neutral. The emotional charge takes place between the pelvic bowl and the diaphragm. So now what I want you to do is come back into this same position and now begin breathing long and deep. Feet are parallel. Your feet are, your feet are pointed outward. There you go. There you go. Feel it. Okay. I want five volunteers. Five volunteers. Raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five. You guys are going to walk around the room and you're going to make sure everybody's feet are actually parallel because it's hard to necessarily, because you don't actually see your own feet. You feel and see at the same time, and it's not a true picture. Yeah, turn those, yeah, turn those toes in, man. Reach down there and grab his feet. Turn them in. Feels different, doesn't it? Huh? Do you know why we do you know why we spread our feet? To get more certainty. To get more certainty. Because when we spread our feet, we feel like we won't have as much instability. So get your feet really parallel. Now, okay, those of you that were serving it. You can go and do it yourself. Now, feel your pelvic bowl. Get a little, get a little funky with your pelvic bowl.
Now feel the relationship between your diaphragm and your pelvic bowl. It makes an, it makes an organic sandwich, a sandwich of your organs. Feel the relationship between your diaphragm and your pelvic bowl. Close your eyes. Get inside your body. Feel that. Now start breathing really deep. Breathing really deep. When there is a relationship between your pelvic bowl and your diaphragm, your system can become empathic and compassionate. Feel that. Feel that. Do it every day. Feel that. Feel that. Do it every day. Wiggle your pelvis again. Get it, get it so that it gets parallel to the earth. Wiggle it around. Now loosen up your diaphragm. Loosen up your diaphragm. Feel the relationship between the pelvis and the diaphragm. One last time, wiggle your pelvis, shake your hips, wiggle your pelvis. Feel your diaphragm now, experience that relationship between the pelvis and the diaphragm. Okay, come standing up and come sitting down. So for all of you who are skilled in anatomy, on the right side of the body, what is, and we'll have questions in a minute, what is that blue liver? Liver rests right below the diaphragm. Liver does what in the body? Cools it or heats it? The liver is your heater. The liver, as Yogi Bhajan would say, is your lover. Now, above the diaphragm and slightly left of center is your... Why is the heart left of center? Why isn't it just tucked in between the two lungs? No, because the sternum would be more protection than the rib cage because the left side of the body is receptive and the heart is one of your major receptivity components. It allows you to respond in a totally neutral way and being totally neutral allows the heart to completely read your surroundings. If the heart had an agenda, the reading of the surroundings would be a mixture of your agenda and the surroundings. Is that clear? So, this is the deal. Your liver sends off heat. If your diaphragm and your pelvis are parallel to each other, the liver sends off the heat, the radiation, the radiance, and your, as long as these are parallel to each other, your diaphragm is relaxed. Even if it's in motion, your diaphragm is relaxed. When the diaphragm is relaxed, that heat of passion penetrates the diaphragm and heats the heart. And passion becomes, say it louder, passion becomes compassion. When these are not parallel to each other, the diaphragm feels at risk. Because right here in the center of the diaphragm is your solar plex, and your solar plex is the root, meaning R-O-O-T, of this whole event that's coming here. Your Akashic record roots in through your solar plex, which your diaphragm is connected to. So if you don't have that 
that equality between your pelvic bowl and your diaphragm, your diaphragm tenses up, which 99 point whatever, you know that just means most everybody, right? When somebody says 99.9, right? It's not a mathematical equation. Everybody is tense here. So what happens is that the heat from the liver ricochets off of this and you get this, what's called this, isn't that a catch-22 when something just keeps going over and over and over and over? Yes? Vicious cycle, thank you. So I don't want to draw on this one anymore. It goes like this. And what is it called? The churning of your gut, right? You get this churning in your gut. Haven't you ever had a relationship with somebody that every time you met them, they really upset you? I mean, you didn't even have to meet them. You just have to think about them, and you get upset, right? And that is because you don't have that equilibrium. You don't have that equality. You don't see them as you. You see them as some distorted other being. And so what happens is that you're, whenever you think about them, something gets off kilter, there's no equality, and all of a sudden your diaphragm tightens up, and not only does it not let the heat from your liver through, it also doesn't let your, what is this yoga, the? It doesn't let the, it doesn't let the kundalini stand up. So your kundalini gets up to here, bang, 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 and that's as far as it goes. So what do you do? to have a heartfelt conversation. You imitate. You mimic. Haven't you ever been with someone that they're just like, oh, wow, so cool, so nice. This is wonderful. Golly Moses, it's so good to see you. And then something happens, right? Something happens. And what does it turn that into. <laughs> Ever had that experience? And what is your response? <laughs> right? Your response is to suddenly go out of kilter, and if you're regressive, you're going to get your feelings hurt so that you can have some. Huh? Sympathy. Ah. Right? Or you will do it less. You'll just go, oh, yeah, this is good. And then you'll go gossip. If you're regressive, if you're aggressive, what you're going to do? <clears throat> right? Yes? And then you're going to have a story that also wants because you want people to sympathetically support your aggression. However, the Tao, right, the Tao, Aki, Tao, or as what's mispronounced as Aikido, the Aki of Tao, hmm? the Aki Tao would go like this, if, you know, your, your equilibrium, right? So the Aki Tao goes, and was around, and you go, ah. and then you say, ah, grasshopper, how nice of you to express that, because what are you trying to do? You're trying to integrate. This is you. You're trying to integrate. You're not trying to expatriate. I'm just trying to rhyme there, you know. Don't. You don't have to take a note on that word. That was just really clever. <laughs> you don't have to push them away. You're trying to integrate. So you're going, oh, wow. Whoa. You know, and then they come back and, whoa. And it's, whoa. And it's a, whoa. And then pretty soon, you in them gets totally exhausted. And you pick it up and you go, hmm. 
<sighs> that was quite fun, huh? That was actually, I, I hadn't practiced my Aikido yet today. And you talk to the you and them. This is a highly awakened man. This is a highly awakened man. A highly awakened man doesn't go woo woo and make some outline. Oh, that person, that person, they're always like that. <laughs> right? That person's always the devil. No, you say, wow. That person is messaging something from within me that is not quite certain that I'm fully capable of engaging, so let me just go through some practice here, right? And what do I prove to myself when after all of that we sit in that nature? What do I prove to myself, that I'm capable or incapable? Capable. And what does my experience that I understand stand up? The Chinese have it right. They teach classes, everybody stands, and they have these standing desks, right? Because what do you have a harder time doing when you're standing? Falling asleep. <laughs> We're just going up through the body. We're almost, we're almost there, you know. You're almost enlightened. So when you have an experience of how you can master a situation with a really nasty, ornery opponent, and you actually succeed in that dance, that akidao means no. It means the dao is no offense. No offense. What do you feel like after that? Do you feel like that person was, was a jerk? Or that person just gave you a good workout? When my worst enemy, whoever that might be, comes up to me, I say, it's practice time. And believe me, believe you, we all have those people that are, we have somehow assigned to that role of being the opposition, correct? We have somehow through lifetimes distanced ourselves from that person and we feel really comfortable with saying, I don't like you. We may not even tell them I don't like you. We may just think it. And through lifetimes and lifetimes we have these relationships because if it happens to us, it happens so I have assembled you, you have assembled us. We have all assembled each other for this moment in this room. And any time in life that you're having an engagement with an idea, a place, a person, or a thing, you have assembled that through eons of time. What can you do in that moment? You can master the connection. You can master the connection. What does a need for sympathy say? I'm having a good time or I'm having a hard time. What does the need for sympathy say? I can make it through this moment because I'm equal or this moment is overwhelming me. I can't make it through this moment. What does it say? What does the need for sympathy say? when things are going really great. It says, eh, yeah, for now, but my experience is it doesn't last that long. You're reserving your reservation for sympathy. You don't want somebody to take your reservation, and you've waited lifetimes for this reservation, right? 
it is going to be the hardest thing that you ever do in life to come up with some way of never being able to have sympathy again because you have assembled the story of your life with just enough flavor that you can move through it by going, wow, this is really uncomfortable, but you know, that's life. Well, this is really uncomfortable, but you know, that's life. And you actually think of yourself as a conscious human being because you're so, you're so resigned to the fact of the discomfort. That's not what we as men need to be doing two years, five years, 10 years, 25 years, 65 years from now. Because the earth is in a death spiral. And what we have is 65 years from 2012 to 2077. The first third of it is 45 years. The second third of it is 15 years. And the third third of it is five years. And they're each one third of the previous length. 15, one third of 45, and 5, one third of 15. It's the awakening, the gathering, and the enchanting. We'll get deep into that tomorrow, but now we're going to do something. Should we do something? Yeah. Aren't you destined to do something right now? Isn't it in your film? Check, <laughs> check your film. By Jove? Well, by golly, all of our film says, be at Camp Raj Yog. Right? Hari Singh is the guy who's like, runs around and says, check your film. Check your film. We really need See, the women outdo us. Huddy Singh said next week there'll be about 70 women. There's probably about 40 men in this room. And it's not a competition, but I think it should be equal next year. I think... So, we can be equal and more at the same time just by our attitude. <laughs> But seriously, we have computer programmers. We've got artists. I see we've got an artist right there, too. I see we've got mathematician who doesn't always get it right. <laughs> but he's an engineer, so he can engineer his way around it. <laughs> we got teachers. We got so many things going on for us. Let's really put ourselves together. And we got so much going on. Let's put ourselves together and really make it a 12-month effort to fill this room. Like, it's like, okay, who gets to go to class today? Because we only have room for 110 people in the room. And the other 50 go, aw. And what do they want? Aw. <laughs> what do they want? Okay, anybody that wants sympathy today, get the out of the room. <laughs> right? Yeah, I go, seats outside. There you go. The guy loves coffee, so if any of you have making... I just overheard a conversation, you know. Coffee is his god, but, you know, one of his gods. And I totally respect that. I have no criticism of that. But I'm just telling you, if ever any of you go out for coffee and you're getting some for Huddy, also get some for him. <laughs> I'm on your team. <laughs> All right, so we're going to actually we're going to actually break down the param karam dharam kriya into its parts. And so what I would like you to do is come into the first part and just start breathing long and deep in part number 1. And what was part number 1 all about? It was about the big, big picture, right? The big, big view. Now, one of the things that I want you to do is really stretch up your shoulders because the shoulder is the third plane line, right? You have your diaphragm, 
excuse me, you have your pelvis first, your diaphragm, so feel your pelvis and your diaphragm, and then feel your shoulders. Feel your shoulders, feel that both shoulders have some equality between the two of them, because the shoulders hold up the key to whether or not you're gonna believe your nonsensical story or live in your commitment to your glory. And once again, I'm rhyming just to be cute. I don't want you to think, oh wow, he's so poetic. You know? I am, but I'm not trying to force you to think it. Get into that glory, really stretch. I loved what, who was it that was teaching the other day? He said, stretch your armpits. Save a, stretch those armpits. I thought, I have never heard that expression in my life. I love it. That's why, that's why I rely upon you. Tell me what I missed. <laughs> now really, really get into that armpit stretch and that shoulder stretch and that, and that, pelvic stretch and that diaphragmatic stretch and just feel this body. It's like this incredible instrument. Tune it. Bless you. You do it twice, we'll deduct. <laughs> you ever get somebody to bless you, bless you again? Okay, now you're just begging. <laughs> Really get up there, get up there. Lift your neck, don't tilt your head back. Lift your neck, lift it, lift it. Feel your crown, experience your crown. Experience the very back where your skull and your spine, where the spine inserts inside the skull. Don't tilt your neck back. Tilt your body back, but don't over tilt your neck. Where the spine inserts the brain stem is what's called the reticular formation. It's a combination of parts the medulla and the pons of your, bot, of your um, primitive brain. It's called the reptilian brain, and the bird brain, because both reptiles and birds have only this. This is that instinctual brain. This is the brain that tells you that you need stuff. It accumulates stuff for you. It hoards stuff for you. And it's the brain that is always sensitive and critical about how you look because it wants you to always look better. You gotta short circuit that point in the system by overwhelming it with adoration. It's gotta feel totally secure, otherwise it's gonna mess you up. It'll make you an instinctual reactor Now, switch out legs. Powerfully. I want you to go, ah, just along with this chanting, just open the throat with ahs. Reach up as high as you can. Stretch your shoulders.
your two hands and come back here, right right here, base of the skull, on the occipital ridge right here. Press in there. Press in there. Take your fingers and just press in there. Close your eyes. Just hold your pressure in there. You're only pressing with the tips of the points of your fingers into the very center where the spine inserts up into the skull. All right, let go. Roll your neck on your shoulders. And the other direction. And come sitting down. Remember how important it was for the pelvis to mirror the earth so that it could hold all of those glands and the organs that are going to create the emotional charge? And how important it was for the parallel nature of the diaphragm? How important it was for you to be able to be in your body, utilizing your body? Correct? Isn't it important for you to, when you're driving your car, that you can see the speedometer, that you can see the gas gauge? Did you ever notice when you tilt down the steering wheel in most cars, you can't see the speedometer, you can't see the speed of the speedometer? Isn't it important for you to be able to see all the gauges on your, on your vehicle at all times? So it's important when you're going through life not to be going all about the gauge is all about the gauge is all about the gauges and forget what you're actually doing in life. That means that your fibula is controlling more than your tibia. That the standards of others around you are more important than the standards that you brought into this world. But there's a hidden feature to this and it's right here at the base of the skull. It's called the reticular formation. This is where your great-great-grandfather controls your life from. This is where the messaging from your great-great-great-great-grandmother is right in there going, nah, can't do that. Seven generations. Do you realize how many people that is? 254 people, including your two parents, sitting you got two parents, four grand, eight great, 16 great great, 32, 64, and 128. You add it up, it comes to 254 ancestors through your DNA are controlling you through not only all of the makeup of your body, but most particularly through your reticular formation. Your reticular formation is your primitive brain and the only job of the primitive brain, the only task of the primitive brain 
is to keep your body alive long enough to reproduce its DNA. That's it. And so nothing about your commis commitment to consciousness or anything like that makes any effort whatsoever according to that. So, could you frack the entire state of Pennsylvania and be okay with it? If that was what the, if the only thing was you being secure long enough to pre reproduce your DNA, you can do anything on earth, can't you? You can pollute the waters, you can pollute the air, you can destroy the ground, you can do whatever. As a matter of fact, you can even run a joystick that controls a, 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 a drone and you can blow up wedding parties knowing that the government will make sure that it's all taken care of in the press. And you do not have any, any, any empathic situation because this is locked off, so all that's happening is that you're boiling inside. And this thing here is telling you, danger, danger, terrorism, danger. And so you're like this, and you're going to everybody else. you got to be nuts not to see what I see. So I'll just assume that you're all nuts and that I have to do what I have to do. Did I just paint a picture of a person that exists on Earth in hundreds of millions, if not billions of bodies, correct? And what is our task to do? You son of a... Like that, yes? Is that going to get them to get out of their reticular formation or lock them further into it? Is that going to get their diaphragm to relax so they go, oh, you know what, you're right. Is that going to get Gobind Singh into the tub? You know what he is? He is your best friend because he's teaching you how you're going to have to deal with the universe. He's saying, hey, Papa, I just came from there. And I saw this place as I was coming in from like 90, 100 million miles. And I tell you, it is one bad half-star hotel, Dad. <laughs> so I'm just going to give you some exercise as I grow up, just as a gift. What enables this to be okay is this, this, and this. Because if this, this, and this are equals, this is neutral. Your instincts go neutral when this this and this, 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 and this are all equals. And that's why it's so important that in addition to all the books that you read, which are, which are great, eat the right food, which is great, do the yoga, but also be aware, how do you move? How do you stand? How do you work with other people? How do you allow their image? And by the way, this reflective activity, what's the cycle of karma in the emotional body? How many years? How many years between six and eight? Seven years. So someone can approach you and it can be a modification of a reflection that you threw out five and a half years ago. But not only did you throw it out five and a half years ago in this lifetime, but it's a genetic reflection from your generations or it's a cosmic reflection from your incarnations and you haven't gotten the picture yet. It's been hitting you every lifetime. It's been hitting you every lifetime. It's been hitting you every lifetime. And you have been denying and ignoring it. What's it going to look like? Is it going to come up and say, please, kind sir? What does a virus that gets, or a, um, a bacteria 
that gets shot down do? It begins with an M-U-T. It mutates, doesn't it? And does it mutate to get weaker or stronger? And when it mutates to get stronger, is it exactly equal to what was originally there? So the subtle nuances are patterns that are just approaching you now. The real shit kickers, the ones that really lambaste you, they're the ones that you've avoided, ignored, subdued, rejected, all lifetimes and lifetimes and lifetimes. How many have ever been hit with a real sucker punch in life? Collective sucker punch is when a team gets together, forms an organization or a, or a company or a family, and then a big sucker punch comes into the organization or the company or the family. That's a collective. We've been ignoring it for a long time. It's like me and Harpal have something in common, right? So we get together and we're driving down the street and we're out in the middle of nowhere and we get a flat tire with no spare and we're outside of cell phone signal. Now, it's Harpal's truck, so it's Huddy's fault. <laughs> but how, how should Harpal and I handle this situation? Man, here's me, I'll, I'll role play. Man, you don't have a spare? And I mean, there's a long story about why he doesn't have a spare. He actually loaned his spare to someone who needed a spare because he's a man of a good heart, right? And here I am with my interpretation of the circumstance, right? Man, what kind of cheapo doesn't have a spare, right? You see? And then, how could you take me? I got to be back to teach class. We're outside of that, blah, 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 right? Right. Or, cool. This is excellent, man. We'll just sit down right here and we'll teach class from here. And we'll see who gets the class and who doesn't. And that will be the whole class. And when we get back there tomorrow sometime, <laughs> after walking through the rain for 22 hours, we'll just ask the simple question, how was the class? Now, example A, example B. Our Paul and I are going to know each other for many years, correct? Right? Example A draws us closer together, pushes us apart. Example B, we're one person or we're going to be enemies. We're one person. Every time that you enter a situation, you've got to have enough time and Probably enough time in today's world is a nanosecond, right? So you have to have enough time to stop and suddenly go, okay, what's the score? Do we have equality here? Am I operating from my reticular instinct? Or are we actually reaching up, reaching in, reaching up, whatever it is, and bringing down cosmic information so that we can produce not who's to blame here except for him, Or, what an opportunity for us to really create the most beautiful thing that's never happened before. Men's camp has never had a class taught that was a 22-hour walk away from at distance. And we come back the next day and we say, so how, how was class? And everybody says, what do you mean? You were here. Because that's where we're going, isn't it? Isn't that where we're going? I am a and another M word before you put your hand down. Okay. And another M word, thank you. 
It's, it, it begins with M-A-S-T-E-R. I am a mystic. I am a man. I am a master. I am a mystic. I am a man. I am a master. I am a mystic. I am a man. I am a master. I am a mystic. I am a man. I am a master. I am a mystic. I am a man. I am a master. And because if it happens to you, it happens through you, those that don't believe you are caused by you. And when those that don't believe you are caused by you, you shouldn't feel bad because what do you want? You should feel great, an opportunity for growth. Here are three people that don't believe I am a mystic, I am a man, I am a master. And so I will just work on my equality, my equilibrium, so that that, that messaging, I actually, the next time that messaging, I just note it and release it. I just note it and then Aikidao, Aikidao goes right through me and I don't take offense by being defense. So that's the whole body from a spiritual anatomy, Men's Camp 2013. I just noticed this looks like a really interesting face, two eyes, a couple of antennas. Got an alien living in there. Okay, come standing up. We have exactly 31 minutes, and we're going to do a 31-minute chant. So I just want you to kind of walk around the room. If you've got to go piss off the deck, please do it. But we are going to end at 5 because we're going to have a, we're going to have a Gurdwara tonight. And the Gurdwara is not for those of us that have been around Gurdwaras for a long time. The Gurdwara is just to give you a taste. Have you ever been to a grocery store where they have those ladies with toothpicks and things that they're just going to give you a taste, a sample? That's what tonight's Gurdwara is. Tonight's Gurdwara is not for our benefit. Tonight's Gurdwara is just to give you a taste of some part of this equilibrium that is available to anyone. Okay, so now what we're going to do is I want you to take your right hand and bring all of your fingers in and just like this. And your left hand, the center of your palm goes over the center of your sternum. And it's the mantra because we're working very focused, very simple, right? We're not trying to get 20 million concepts into our brain. The one concept that we're getting into the brain is I am, and it begins with an E. It's your fault. What can I say? Of course you got the answer wrong. Of course, <laughs> I was, but thank God you get at least an answer wrong. Because the road to success is paved by the bricks of hurry. I mean, the bricks of, <laughs> excuse me, the bricks of failure, excuse me. <laughs> I just equated the two words. <laughs> we love each other, man. You can only talk to somebody that way when you have a love that goes beyond any superficial nonsense, right? Yes, equality, equality, right? Because we are equal to every moment, and this mantra is just that. So I want you to begin. We'll be, it'll fade up. And be in just your sweetness voice to begin with. It's a moment of adoration. We're falling in love with you. Such 
Obstacles to opportunities. We're not praying to a fictional God. We're producing an electromagnetic field. Yeah. 
Yourself rise now, not physically. Let the voice just put on the throttle ever so slightly. Yeah. 
Yeah. 
yourself impress yourself in the last three minutes obstacle equals opportunity
mystic, I am a man, I am a master. I am a mystic, I am a man, I am a master. Inhale deep. State it again. I am a mystic, I am a man, I am a master. Inhale deep. State it again. I am a mystic, I am a man, I am a master. Inhale deep. Absorb it. Every cell, let it permeate every cell of your body. From your feet that are the direction to your angles, the momentum to your lower legs, the standards to your knees, your balance to your thighs, your intention and your motivation to your pelvis, your concept. Exhale. Inhale to the abdomen that's contained within the pelvic bowl that holds the glands and organs that create the peptides and hormones that develop the emotions that can move your life like great tools. Exhale. To inhale to the diaphragm that lets that heat come through into your heart the lungs that bring the oxygen through the messaging of your throat and your inner ears, to your shoulders which hold up the reticular formation. Exhale. Inhale. All the way up through your skull into the crown of your glory. You are the second coming. You are the second standing. You are the Kundalini rising. Exhale. Last time, inhale. Absorb all of this. together. May the long time sun shine upon you, all love surround you, and the pure light within you guide your way on. May the long time sun shine upon you, all love surround you, and the pure light within you guide your way on. So your palms over your eyes. Open your eyes into the darkness. Slowly move your palms forward. And gaze at the heart center, at the mandala of your palms to the interactive, isn't it? In the classes, when there's learning going on, it's interactive, huh? So, what goes on between now and dinner will be at 6.30 or thereabouts. Give yourselves a hand. Thank mm -hmm. you.